Welcome to the Hollywood Raw YouTube page, guys. We're happy to have you here. Make sure you like, subscribe, leave us comments, do all the stuff. What are you waiting for? Let's go. I got a drug addiction to feed. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Hollywood Raw Podcast. My name is Adam Glenn. Uh, on the other side of the country is Dax. Hi, Dex. What up, buddy? How would you describe who's on the podcast today? You've known this guy for a very, very long time. Uh, yeah, so Kevin Blatt's coming on today. He uh, He's known as a Hollywood fixer. I would say a crisis PR guru. But also, I met him when his nickname was the sex tape swindler. <laughs> where that's, that's what really everyone right. knew him for he was the guy who peddled all of the sex tapes in hollywood and you know just be like broke onto the scene with the paris hilton one and i th i believe he had a hand in the kim kardashian one the Vern troyer one i mean it's just like there was a time period where every sex tape kind of pointed back to him like he was either a part of the deal, like helping the celebrity get it out or a part of the deal by making it disappear um, for the celebrity. And he was just kind of the guy involved in everything. And it's just, you know, I, I don't know. I, we, um, he popped up on that vice episode about TMZ. And so we kind of were, we're texting back and forth, reconnecting because we hadn't spoken in years and years and years. And so um, we connected and I said, you know what, you should come on the podcast. I think that you have a very interesting job that a lot of people don't know about. There's going to be a lot of people out there that don't agree with his job, but I think that there is still a fascinating side of what he has done in the industry that people will sit back and, I don't know, maybe uh, enjoy listening about what he's done. That was a wild era during the celebrity sex tape. I mean, there hasn't been a celebrity sex tape for, that I can remember in a long time. But because it became like not, it's like not cool anymore. If that makes sense, like yeah, now it feels gross. And I know that sounds weird to say that it feels gross now, but years ago it was like everyone was doing one. It was like a you know porn uh, celebrity porn tapes were coming out left and right. Everyone had one. And then it kind of like just stopped because it got gross. And... But there's also, but Dax, there's also like a suspicious part of it where it was, oh my God, my sex tape just got out there. And we all fell for it. Like, oh my God, how are these sex tapes coming out on the internet? But as we know that, that for those videos to come out, both parties have to sign off on the video. And that's how we're able to see them. But in the end. Well, those are the further ones that like make money. Like. You know what I'm saying? That like get onto a DVD or on a website that's behind a paywall that you pay to watch. Yeah, they're those celebs signed off. So like, don't let Paris and Kim tell you any different. Those those tapes were signed off. And you know what? Honestly, maybe I'm wrong or here. I, this is what I've kind of like thought over the years. We'll ask Kevin about it, though. He He will know better than anyone else, like the true rules, because I feel like I've been saying something for a long time and. I want to confirm that what I have been saying is 100% accurate. Before we get to Kevin, we read your reviews. If you give us a review on the Apple uh, podcast app, uh, just put in Hollywood Raw, go all the way to the bottom, give us five stars and say a few kind words. We give you a little shout out on the air because we appreciate the support. Dax, can you uh, show us someone we, who supported us? I can. This comes from... Peace, love, cheer, go Falcons. Um, and it's five stars. Can't get enough is the headline. You guys are the greatest. You keep me company on my 6 a.m. walks. The only problem is I have to portion out carefully because you only have two releases a week. I love your guests. I love your take on the latest news. I love how you both have different points of view. West Coast slash East Coast. Don't even think of stopping from Pam L. Yes. Pam. That's Pam what we're going L. for. We like having a uh, points of views that are different. I don't know if we can do more than two releases a week. It is. <laughs> it's a lot of work having a podcast. Dude, we're recording this live right now at my time. It's 1220 in the morning. I, I, I've been having a long day. I mean, honestly, I'm just very, very tired. However, I'm trying to relax a little bit because come right now we're recording this. It's, you know, 
can I say the date we're recording this? Because that's yeah, right. You can say it. Okay, this is right now August 22nd, okay, at 1220 in the morning. I am taking a little bit of a break and chilling because right after Labor Day weekend, Fashion Week starts, and then it becomes my busy – one of my busy times of the year. I have the beginning of the fall, beginning of September, and then uh, the end – the I'd say early May are my two busiest times of the year, and I'm working pretty much every single day. It's just – it's nonstop, so – I'm just tired. It's a late night. So doing more than two shows a week, Pam, I love you, but it's not going to happen anytime soon. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a lot on us. But I appreciate the review. I appreciate you listening. Guys, keep the reviews coming. It's the best thing to do to support this podcast. On to today's guest, Dax, your friend, Kevin Blatt. Kevin Blatt, thank you so much for joining us. Excited yes. to have you. It was fun. Uh, you know, we kind of reconnected after the whole Vice episode came out on TMZ. You were on it. I was on it. Um, and we started texting each other. So I'm really happy to get you on here because it's been a while. We haven't chatted for many, many moons, buddy. How are you doing? Even way before the pandemic, man. And let me just say how happy I am to see you guys doing a podcast together. Like, <laughs> now we have three Jews on at the same time. We get, I think we need a minion. Or I think we get a minion. <laughs> um, but no, you know, it's so great when you see guys. You guys are all grown up now. I feel like I knew you guys when you were kids. And mm-hmm. probably were if, if I ask what your ages are now. And I think back to how long ago it was. I mean, I'm 54 right now. I mean, I, in my I, head, I'm 34, but... I'm trying to think when I actually started TMZ. I I'm, I must have been 22. God, you were a baby. I was a damn baby, dude. I was and just I'm, fresh out Adam, of college. I met Adam on the street. I was representing Casey Jordan during the whole height of the Charlie Sheen meltdown. I had brought her to Good Morning America. Yeah. And if there was ever a scenario that resembled the movie Get Him to the Greek... It was last week, Casey Jordan, high on cocaine, flying first class with me. You know, ABC took care of everything. We stayed at the Mm -hmm. Trump. That's that's how long ago this was. You wouldn't catch me. Dead in that bus. Nobody will be seen at the Trump ABC. You you wouldn't catch ABC booking people at Trump Hotel now either. (laughs) No, no, you wouldn't. It's funny because publicists – won't even allow i mean the trump to me is one of the best location hotels in new york city and not only that has one of the best restaurants in new york city in in, inside the hotel and now publicists were like when trump started running for president publicists were telling their clients to not stay at the hotel because they can't be photographed coming out of the hotel because then they are considered a trump supporter it went even one step further though because when i was doing some stuff with abc recently it was a security issue with Secret Service and everything else that uh, people were just freaked out to go in and out of that hotel. Even the Trump supporters didn't want to go in there because they were scared of all the the FBI and the Secret Service and all kinds of crazy shit. But here we are. You know what? Here, here we good are. To see right. you. It's good <laughs> to see you again, Adam. And I, it's great to see Dax. I mean, this is just cool. And you know, yeah, the I, Vice I love thing, it, Kevin. The Vice thing has been so great for me because not only have I been shopped about three different things this week. It's just, you know, look, it was a time. It was an era that. Wait, 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 do this. Explain what you used to do for work, and then we'll get into what you do do for work now. Okay, so I don't know how far back you want me to go, but I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. I came out to Southern California. Tell us, were you vaginal or were you (laughs) C-section? It was vaginal, which explains. Okay, that. okay, <laughs> okay. Not that far back. Come back forward. Let, let's go into career time. So I grew up in Cleveland. I came out here in '96. I had a myriad of jobs, from a strip club DJ down there to selling a uh, land when telecom stuff to selling Howard Stern radio. And uh, my brother got me involved in this crazy business, the adult internet business, because he happened to cold call a company that was growing. By leaps and bounds. Every time he'd go there, he, he was in the security systems business and he was giving card access to the kids that were working there. And these are guys that were latchkey kids that grew up with computers, right? And their parents weren't home. They would take apart their computers, put them back together. They had the foresight to buy URLs like sex.com or breast.com or teens.com. And they built adult websites. And my brother was like, man, Kevin, there's so much money. These people are hosting porn online. I'm like, what? 
It's like, these are kids that are like 19, 20 years old and they're making a hundred thousand dollars a month. And I said, how do I get involved in this? And before you knew it, my brother and I became the Pied Pipers of porn. We got in this business. Um, I had worked for a bunch of guys that were young, uh, but never in a corporate environment, you know? So they knew that I was an older guy that could show them the ropes as far as how to do things. I cut my teeth uh, marketing a bunch of adult websites. Went on Howard Stern with a couple porn stars, one being Houston, who did the Houston uh, 620 man gangbang in one day. Long story short, um, I end up uh, becoming known as this PR guy in the adult business. And then a friend of mine comes to me and he says, you're in LA. I want you to go meet with this guy named Don Thrasher. He's got a tape of a woman named Paris Hilton. And uh, she's going to be a oh, big Wait, deal. wait, wait. So Paris Hilton was literally your first celebrity sex tape that you dealt with? Yeah. The, so when One I, of the biggest tapes of all time? The biggest tape of all time. She's uh, not bigger than Kim's. Bigger well, than Pam. Uh, but, we'll go in. you... but go into, yeah, let's first start. I want to hear this story. So I'll explain to you why it's the biggest one of all time in a second. Uh, and I love explaining this because you'll totally get it. So they tell me to go meet with this guy, Don Thrasher and to see if we can make a deal. I said, I don't even know who this woman is. I said, the last name's Hilton. And they're like, yeah, you know, she's the heir to the Hilton hotel fortune. And I'm like, okay, never heard of it. Turns out she was hanging out with a bunch of penthouse pets that I knew and they were all partying and doing tons of drugs back in the day. So I kind of knew who she was from coming in and out of all the Hollywood clubs here, but I didn't really know her. I just saw her around. Anyway, I'm like, what's the worst that can happen? Um, I'll, I'll do this. Thing, and hopefully I could secure it from this guy. And these people in Seattle really wanted this tape. And I saw it. We did a $50,000 deal with the, and a, a third of the back end profits with Don. And I said, look, do you have full rights and full permission? He says, look, Rick Solomon is my roommate and I'm pretty much doing this on his behalf, but obviously we can't say that he's behind it. And I said, look, as long as it's kosher, I'm with you, right? What's the worst that could happen? Well, the worst that could happen is I end up getting sued for $20 million by Paris Hilton, by her parents, by Rick Solomon, by everybody. And it became just the nuttiest thing that's ever happened in my life, but also the biggest stroke of luck business-wise. Because, you know, what's the old adage? When, when life throws you lemons, you make lemonade, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody knew. I was a preppy kid living in, on the Costa Golf Course in San Diego, playing golf, minding my own business. The next thing you know, my neighbors now see me on television. I'm on 2020. I'm on Howard Stern. And the amount of exposure, this thing blew up in 2003. We're talking about this tape 20 years later. If somebody would have told me in 2003 that we would still be talking about Paris Hilton and her sex tape or that I would have made a living putting out sex tapes or more or less making sex tapes go away and not going online, I wouldn't have believed it. Yeah. So wait, wait. So rewind. So they sue. Okay. They sue. I may be wrong, but I thought that she had to have signed off and given her permission for yes. that thing to go public. So what Eventually. the hell happened? Okay. So initially this was a website called sexbrat.com. And at that time we had Dr. Laura Schlesinger. This is before your time, you guys, but there was a, a, a psychologist, like a Dr. Joyce brothers type, or before there was Dr. Drew, there was this Dr. Laura. We she know, had a sex tape. We know Dr. Laura. Okay, I, I, look, I, again, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I literally was just <laughs> hanging out right outside of her house up in uh, Lake Arrowhead. She's got a beautiful house right on the lake overlooking the water. It's beautiful. Tell her I send my regards. <laughs> um, so yeah, this website housed a bunch of salacious material. Um, and that's where we wanted this thing to reside. However, because the owners of the website knew Seth Warshawski really well, and you'll recall that name because he's the one that put out the Pam and Tommy sex tape. They all knew each other in Seattle and they knew even with Seth, uh, if you, if you recall the story, he was never going to really release the tape. It was more of a shot in the air saying, Hey, we have this tape. We're going to show it at such and such date and such and such time. And it was a ruse to get internet traffic. As you know, it, the traffic is the lifeblood of any website. And back then, especially, you know, at the beginning of broadband and, and high speed internet, it was all about the clicks because that's how you were able to monetize stuff and, and the signups. You know, there was a world before Pornhub where people actually paid for porn and they would take their credit cards out and they would spend $29.95 a month and that credit card would get banged every single month until you canceled. 
And a lot of these adult websites made it so impossible to cancel, like Girls Gone Wild, Joe Francis, Vivid Video. All these people had a mousetrap. So imagine thousands and thousands and thousands of people joining your adult website, okay? Uh, maybe they're high, maybe they're drunk, maybe they're just horny and they whip off their credit card late at night and they forget. They don't read the credit card statements and they see American Telnet services. They don't think that that's an adult website that's billing them. It's also the reason why Pornhub proliferated and all this free content came along because the adult industry screwed so many customers that there's no longer faith in putting yeah. your credit card on. So that being said, I get sued by everybody. And, you know, now I have to retain lawyers and I'm getting served and I'm literally jumping out the back window of my condo in La Costa. I mean, I've never been sued for $20 million. But the good thing is, if you don't have $20 million, you really can't be too worried, right? I knew I didn't have any money. But again, that was that was the that was the tipping point. That was that was the beginning of what has now become my new career. And it's taken so many different, so many weird uh, cross sections. So the Kim Kardashian tape comes along to me a couple of years. Later. Actually, no, let me go back. No, I need to know how the Paris one finally went out because okay. if they're suing for 20, yeah. how did that one see the light of day? Okay, so that was the initial tape. That was the green tinged X-ray vision tape that you'll recall where her eyes are glowing in the dark. She had nothing to do with that. This was a complete uh, and utter shock. Oh, uh, this was a retaped one. There you. we go. You, you're good, Dex. <laughs> so what happens is she comes back from Australia where she's filming a movie called House of Wax, and she literally comes to a shitstorm. She comes home to this crazy media thing, and she is embarrassed, and she's freaking out. No doubt. I'm, I'm telling you right now that that was all sincere and all real. It wasn't until Rick Solomon and his brother Jim were looking all over online and seeing how many websites were fraudulently posting that they had this tape and if you join for two hundred dollars you get a six-month membership to see it or if you join for fifty dollars and what they do is they took screen caps they pirated my tape and put it on their you know the website saying it's in there and by the time you bought got into these websites and saw that there wasn't anything in there and you got ripped off there was a float of millions and millions and millions of dollars and i'm talking about websites in malaysia websites in australia websites in china japan places where you're once you give your credit card, it's over, okay? Mm -hmm. So when I say that this was the biggest selling sex tape of all time, it's not just how many DVDs came out from Red Light District Video. And believe me, there were hundreds of thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of DVDs. It was also the website, hotelaris.com. There was also people that would sign up to see the feed on demand in hotel rooms. So it was the perfect storm at the perfect time with all this new technology. And then you had all this fraud that were just infringing upon the rights of publicity of Paris. When I say rights of publicity, like Dax Holt is the only person that could use Dax Holt. If you have a good lawyer and you've done this for yourself, you know that once you're trademarked, you know, that's how you shut somebody down, that they're using your rights of publicity. You're the only person, Dax Holt, that could do a podcast with the name Dax Holt. So that's how we had to go after a lot of people later on that were infringing upon One Night in Paris. But I estimate that that tape in itself, legal sales alone, probably a half a billion dollars. With the legal sales, over a billion, easily, easily. It still makes money all these years later, and it's free everywhere. So, can, so uh, not yeah, not to be uh, you know too kind of insight, but how much did you know were you able to make off if you don't mind me asking? You know, I'll forgive you for asking that question if you forgive me <laughs> for answering because I don't know if the IRS is listening in there too. But I will say this: I didn't make as much money as people think. You know, that's the old adage: perception is reality, right? Uh, even my friends to this day that I went to high school with think I got naked girls floating in my pool. And I'm like, Hugh Hefner out here because I was in the adult industry. But again, that whole perception thing. Now, initially, I got paid, believe it or not, uh, when I went on the Howard Stern show for sexbrat.com, I had negotiated that every time I said sexbrat.com on Howard's show, they were to pay me $1,000. And every time I got Howard to say sexbrat.com, I was to get paid two. Now, for you guys and everybody listening out there, when you get off of this 
Great podcast, by the way. Go to YouTube and type in Kevin Blatt Howard Stern. And I want you guys to total up how many times I say sexbreath.com. <laughs> I got Howard to say it. When I tell you I got like a $32,000 check from these guys, and that started a long relationship of me working with the Paris Hilton sex tape. Now, that was in addition to a marketing fee. I, and then when I opened up the website, Hotel Eris, I had gotten a piece of the action with that. So I made a lot of money in the beginning. From 2003 to 2006 was the height of it. But again, being that I was able to get shop tapes of Cameron Diaz and Colin Farrell and Vern Troyer, which Dax knows he saw that thing, um, and all these other people. And then Kim Kardashian comes along. And I end up meeting with a guy named Ray J at the Cheesecake Factory in Woodland Hills. I didn't know who Ray J was. He was this little little guy who said he was a rapper and his cousin was Snoop Dogg. And I knew that he was Brandy's brother. That's all I knew. And when he told me, he's like, listen, man, you know, Kim wants to do a tape. You know, Kim's best friends with Paris. And I said, yeah, I think Kim organizes her client, her, her closets and stuff because I saw it on TMZ. I remember you guys yeah. had come. The fact that she was just some hang around. And I remember them getting in the hide, I believe, was was on Sunset. And Tara Reid wasn't allowed in. But literally, Kim wasn't allowed in in the first frame of video, if I remember correctly. She was really a nobody. And uh, he said she wants to release this thing for free because she wants to be bigger than Paris. This is what's fueling her fire. And she wants to be famous. And I convinced him, please, you have to call Kim and tell her not to release this for free. There's so much money at stake here, and I can get you the biggest deal in the history of tapes in the adult industry if you just listen and trust me. And he got up from that table wearing his military jacket. We walked to this Lamborghini, and he gave me a hug. I have to go up here because he's this tall. And he said, we're going to do this. And then a week later, I read that Vivid had just gotten a deal doing the Kim Kardashian sex tape. Oh, he screwed so, you over, huh? Yeah, and that's, this, started a, this started a war between me and, and Steve Hirsch. But again, it was only because, I know your audience is going to appreciate this, Joe Francis has a relationship with the Kardashian family. They are thick as thieves. Well, they, used, they, they still stay at his house down in Mexico in all the time. Me. Like when you see photos of Kim or Chloe like on the beach in Mexico, it's normally at his, what is it, Punta Cana? Punta Mita. Uh, Punta Mita. Punta Mita. Punta Mita. Uh, a state down there where uh, he hangs out. They're really, really tight with him. Now, and here's the thing. I have a real issue with this. I mean, yeah, I might be the former porno guy and all that stuff coming from the adult industry, but the Kardashians literally support and are friends with a guy who is probably the biggest exploiter of women and underage women too, by the way. I could tell you that unequivocally because they wouldn't let him into a bar when I invited him to my 30th birthday party. Was it my 30th or my 40th? Your buddy Mike Walter showed up to that party. And I'll, never, <laughs> I'll never forget. He pulled up in a yellow Ferrari and they wouldn't let him into the front door of the Belmont. And I said, do you know who that is? That's Joe <laughs> Francis. They go, yeah, we know who he is. And he brings underage girls here and he's not allowed in. Oh and I was God. blown away because there was nobody bigger than Joe Francis back then. Yeah. But so I have an issue with the fact that the Kardashians go down there. They support this guy, right? There's mm -hmm. no blowback on the Kardashians for being you know, involved with a crazy guy who basically... He, he's he hit from Steve Wynn. You know, he had a hit out on him from Steve Wynn, allegedly, because he owed so much money to Wynn. I think he had IRS problems. He literally fled the country with all these lawsuits that were pending. Mario Lopez stays at his house. No problem. Kardashians. Yeah, everyone does. And there, yeah, you're right. There's no weird blowback for hanging out with him. But yet he was like the guy, the guy behind a lot of porn. And tricked. Women, literally, hey, I'll give you a T-shirt and a hat if you show me your boobs. This is what this guy did for a living. And then, you know, he would pretty much upsell the girls by saying, you know, if you want to do something more hardcore, we have a brown bag, brown paper bag, you know, harder core girls going wild. Because they had such a big mail list that they could ship out new content every single month to people. But let's not talk about him. He, he's a scumbag. And <laughs> that whole era is over with. I mean, that whole era is gone. So, um, so yeah, I, I cut my teeth. On that tape, the Cameron Diaz thing came along. That got suppressed. Wait, so how did this Cameron Diaz tape? How did the Cameron Diaz tape come into your hands? Like you actually got to see the video, but I don't think a lot of people even know that there even there was even a tape that existed because it was. It wasn't, 
it wasn't a sex tape per se. So what had happened was I got contacted because of all the media I did uh, after Paris and getting involved with Kim. Or after Paris, somebody called me up, real cryptic phone conversation through Skype. Are you Kevin Blatt? Yes. KB? I'm like, yes. The celebrity sex tape guy? I'm like, what can I do for you? It's like, I have tape of uh, this woman, Cameron Diaz. It's her first thing she ever shot. She's leading a guy around in a dog collar topless under bridges downtown i'm like what he's like yeah she was a model she was 18 years old and she was with this modeling agency blah blah it gives me the whole story and i'm like it's interesting but do you have her rights because i'm not going to touch this thing after getting sued by the hilton family you gotta be crazy you gotta show me that you have the rights and you gotta send me ten thousand dollars as a retainer right now see i had never done that before either i'm like you gotta pay me ten thousand then maybe i'll talk to you it's like well can we get on howard stern i'm like i'll get you anywhere you want just send me the 10 grand i wake up this was on a um this was on a saturday that monday was july 4th and all hell broke because my phone started ringing and i started getting voicemails that were so quickly coming through my phone that it shut down my phone i'm like what the hell's going on and then i see these guys in the, Montenegro, I didn't even know where Montenegro was. They were spoofing their IPs and hiding where they were from, but they basically put out a press release saying that they had a sex tape of Cameron Diaz, and this is where you had to go to see it at such and such date, such and such time, and it gave a descriptive, disgusting overview of her being topless and just having done The Mask and this big movie with Jim Carrey. It's a big deal. Uh, all the quotes are attributed to Kevin Black. Right. Oh and God. literally, I am getting sued by Ed McPherson, who's a very powerful lawyer here. Um, I am just back on, on, on the train. And these people are all coming after me, and I'm being set up. So I ended up calling her lawyers, and I said, look, don't shoot the messenger, man. I got set up here, too. Let me help you find out who these guys are. And let's shut it down. Mm-hmm. And I got involved. That was the first time I had gotten involved on the other side of the desk where I was actually helping the celebrity, trying to figure out what was going on through the kinds of people I know, hackers, et cetera, et cetera. We kind of traced down where they were and who was doing it. And it became a a major situation where she was being extorted by a photographer named John Rutter. And John Rutter was partnered with these guys in Montenegro. And before you know it, Rutter goes into Lavely and Singer's office in Beverly Hills and goes to negotiate a deal for $2 million to get the content back. And when John goes back to his apartment in Venice Beach and puts his key in the door, the FBI just raids him and jumps on him. And that was the beginning. Extortion. Oh, yeah. 100% extortion. So that's another thing we could get into and talking about because that's the first question everybody asks me is how I don't go to jail for extortion and, and all the stuff I do. So, Kevin, in a situation like that, do you first they're going to sue you and then you say, hold up, I'm going to work with you and help you out. Do they mm-hmm. compensate you for helping them out? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So cool. that didn't really become a thing with me until the Colin Farrell tape came into play. Once Colin Farrell came into play, that was the first time I, I saw that there was an opportunity to work the other side. And this is a really interesting story, and I've told it a million times online, but your audience is going to love this. I was minding my own business in San Diego one night, seven o'clock, the phone rings, another cryptic phone conversation. Hey, are you KB, the celebrity sex tape guy? Yes, what can I do for you? We have a tape of an A-list actor with a B-list model, and uh, it's the most unbelievable celebrity sex tape you're ever gonna see. Can you come up and meet with us? Can can you come meet with us at Mel's Drive-In in in an hour? I said, "Uh, bro, I live in San Diego. And for those of you who don't know Southern California traffic or logistics, that is a good two and a half hour to three hour drive on a Sunday Mm -hmm. night. But me being the whore that I am, Dex and Adam, (laughs) I got a little bag, I got in my car and I just started driving. And as I'm driving, the guy sends me a text. I'll be wearing an orange John Deere hat and a green sleeveless parka. I read that. That sounds too freaky. I don't know. You're insane. Like, who the hell are you? Elmer <laughs> Fudd. I'm meeting with Elmer Fudd and at, at was driving, right? So <laughs> I drive up there and I get there and I walk in and there's a guy sitting against the window and he's got the green sleeveless parka and he's got the John Deere hat. And I sit down and I go, hey, with a guy, huh? He goes, yeah, 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 sit down. Um, I'm just waiting for my partner to get here. Have the cheesecake. And I'm like, cheesecake? I'm lactose intolerant. I'm like, what are we doing here, bro? 
And the guy says, let's wait till my partner gets here. Guy walks in, big muscle guy, he sits down next to him. He's like, did you tell the guy what we have him? He's like, no, I was waiting for you. Waitress comes over, says, can I get you something to eat? And the guy goes, can I have a plate of deli meat? And I'm like, the guy was in a keto before he, I even heard a keto. And I'm like, look at him. <laughs> This guy's ordering a plate of meat. The other guy's like Elmer Fudd. The guy's got an Emmy folder in front of him. I'm like, what is going on? Can you please tell me? And the guy leans over. He says, I have a tape of Colin Farrell. And he's with a black playmate named Nicole Narain. And I go, hmm. I remember that very well. Yeah. I'm like, this is interesting because there's not very many black playmates. And I said, guys, you know, I got to tell you up front, male sex tapes don't sell like female sex tapes. The whole allure of a celebrity sex tape is seeing a beautiful uh, woman who's a celebrity doing naughty things they're not supposed to do. You know, that is really the whole appeal. And there's only so many gay men and so many women that are going to whip out a credit card to see Colin Farrell schlong. Let's be honest yep. here. So I, I'm brutally honest with these guys. They go, well, we are, we already have an offer for 1.2 million. And this is when I know they're bad poker players because there's nobody giving them $1.2 million sight unseen, right? And I go, okay, when are you going to get that 1.2? And they said, tomorrow. I said, bro, if you could find a bank anywhere in the world that's going to wire you money on a Saturday, I'll give you another <laughs> one. Okay? So I knew it was full of shit. So I go, look, I'd have to see this thing. I don't know if I even want to get involved. And they start whispering with each other. And then they come back and they go, listen, we really weren't planning, planning on doing this. Would you agree to get blindfolded? And... Would you go in the back of our car? We're only going to go up the street. It'll be five minutes. I'm like, blindfolded? Because if you could just put a bandana over, at least don't want you seeing where you're going. And again, you're like, crazy, Kevin. I know. You're I insane. Know. I don't have my piece on me. I didn't bring a gun. I don't travel with the gun. It's like, I, I'm like, okay. Again, I was a whore. So I now realized that I was in a Honda Accord in the back seat in a hatchback. Not even in the back seat. I was, I was curled up in a hatchback with a bandana over my head. And I ended up going to a house, which I now realize was Sunset Plaza, the windy road behind yeah. Miles. Oh. And I, I call it the Wayne matter because it was like being in that Batman old place. And I walk in and, and, and there's a study and then they put this VCR out and they put a tape in and there's Colin Farrell with a shaved head, completely naked with a cigarette dangling off his lip and holding a, a Guinness with the biggest schlong I've ever seen on a small guy. And I'm like, oh, my God, does he breathe through that thing? What is that, right? <laughs> and he looks over at Nicole and he says, I could eat that kitty for breakfast, for fucking lunch, and for fucking dinner. And I'm like, yeah, that's called Farrell, all right. Wow. He was a little wasted, and he was into it. And I'm like, all right, man, this is Colin Farrell. Let me make some phone calls for you guys again. I'd like to under-promise and over-deliver. I still think it's a male sex tape. And I don't know if it's going to sell. I make a couple calls. And the next thing I know, I, I get a phone call from a guy named David Han Schmidt. Do you remember that name, Dax? That back name today? sounds so familiar. David Han Schmidt was a celebrity sex tape broker way before I even existed. But he was doing lowbrow stuff like Tanya Harding with Jeff Galuli. He did uh, Paula Jones, who was a girl that was attached to Bill Clinton. None of these yeah. people were A-list. They were all D-liberties, as I call them. Just one, one ladder short of a C-liberty. They were D-liberties. And the guy says, listen, Jew boy, you better step off of this deal or you're going to get hurt. I'm like, who is this? This is David Hahn Schmidt. And if you know it's good for you, stay away from that Colin Farrell tape. That's my tape. So this was the guy who had found it, was bird-dogging it for the $1.2 million, right? He actually was a bad, bad guy. This guy ended up, they found him dead, hanging in a shower uh, in his place in Phoenix, Arizona. And people still speculate to this day, he had some kind of compromising material on Tom Cruise. Um, I know that it revolved around his wedding, and I know that they found him hanging in the shower and everybody wanted to blame the Scientologist for it. That's all I know. Nobody really knows. If you ask me, I think he was a nutcase and he just killed himself. So that really opened up the, the landscape for me. Let me tell you something. All of a sudden I become the new celebrity sex tape broker. What a moniker. Now, I, I definitely remember the Colin Farrell one. I mean, there was a, there was a bunch, the Vern Troyer one. I had to burn my eyeballs after seeing that one. 
Plus, he was that my was buddy, a- so that was weird too. But like, yeah. there, there's been a lot. What is like? What would you say though is the craziest one? Not even it tells the names yet. Like, what's yeah? What like what's the what, what piece of content be- that came across your desk? Or just what? like people would be shocked. Having oral sex with a man. Uh, that was something I wasn't supposed to see. It's something I didn't get involved with. I didn't touch. It was so shocking to me. Um, then there was Tom Sizemore's tape, which was really troubling. And he passed away. May he rest in peace. But he was shacked up at the Chateau Marmont with seven hookers smoking crystal meth. And he had what's called a priapism. And a priapism is when you have an erection that lasts longer than four and a half hours. It just never goes down. And there was a lot of, um, boy, I don't even know how, tossing salads. Could we say that in front of oh, your God. audience? Cool. Yeah, there was a lot of that. And there was a lot of just him talking into the camera to Heidi Fleiss and like, look, look what you made me do. Look at what I'm doing. And then people were throwing dildos at each other. It was like a Fellini movie on crystal meth at the Chateau Marmont, but with sex. That was weird. Fern Troyer was pretty weird too, though. That was something that you don't see every day. And that, no. as I said, you, you heard my quote in the Vice piece, right? I mean, mm-hmm. the first, first 10 that, minutes. Yeah. That that was definitely, it looked like birth in reverse. Yeah. <laughs> He's going down on her, Adam, for the first 10 minutes. It looks like a baby trying to get into the world. I thought that was a great line. That was funny. <laughs> that was a good line. But let me ask you this. So, obviously, you just said the name. But what was the craziest content that ever came across your desk that um, you, you know, you just saw it, Like, is there one that you came and tell us a celebrity name that, that you saw with this, that involved a celebrity that was just so wild that blew your mind. Yeah. I, I, you know, I can't tell the celebrity, but obviously huge, huge um, girl group. Um, she, this person had a real pension for seeing her husband sleeping with other people like the help um good looking people but like really like hard to believe that these people were like you know part of that culture and again look being in the adult business i've learned to not really judge i don't discriminate look we were all brought up on if their credit cards go through and they're into it and there's no kids and no animals it's all good by us who cares if it's gay midgets you know the trans, whatever it is, whatever people are into, love is love, right? So we don't really care. But I will say, I've seen what? some crazy stuff that to sit down and say, what's the craziest? I really, you know, I'm doing a documentary right now and uh, we're very close. I'm going through all the archival footage. I'm about to sign the deal with a major network, a streamer to put out a doc that's a three part series about the rise and fall of the adult internet and you know, the rise and fall of celebrity and the sex tapes. And then obviously I had gone on to meeting Dax and you guys through finding out in 2008 that the new pornography was celebrity gossip. Yeah, And you know, being around Hollywood at that time and having gotten in the circles with Rick Solomon and all these other people, rock stars that I knew and actors, it allowed me the luxury to be around a lot of celebrities that you were covering at the time. And when I met with Mike Walters, I was starring in a movie called American Cannibal, which is an independent film. We did Tribeca and um, it became such a weird juggernaut because this film was all about reality television and how far people were willing to go to become famous, right? Mm -hmm. And it ends up getting submitted to Tribeca, but initially it was a pitch film. It was a show how people pitch television. It turned into something completely different because the guys in New York met me and they saw that I was a little over the top with my stories and the sex tapes and et cetera, et cetera. A couple of guys pitched me a couple of ideas for shows, one being virgin territory. When you win it, you lose it. And they were, we were going to do a show with eight medically verified male virgins locked in a house with eight porn stars for however long they can't touch themselves. Or they can't touch the celebrities or they're prematurely ejected from the house. So that was the pitch. And, you know, there was a series of challenges like the STD spelling bee. There was milf and cookies. There was, <laughs> there was a bunch of things that it was a tongue in cheek thing. And then the other idea they had was starvation Island where we would go out and starve a bunch of people on an Island, uh, no food, no water, no shelter. And then they might have to live with a cannibal family and might have to eat flesh, human flesh. Oh God. 
it was a crazy pitch, but this movie kind of documents mm -hmm. me setting out to do a show. And I'm not going to tell you which show we settled on because it's a Lord of the Flies type of thing that happens. But the long and short of it was it got into Tribeca and these guys had no money to promote it. And they're like, yo, you're like the marketing guy. You put out the Paris Hilton sex tape. What, what do you recommend we do? And I said, let's send a letter to De Niro and Jane Rosenthal stating that they have to cease and desist from showing this film because I may have violated NDAs with Cameron Diaz, Paris Hilton, Kim Kardashian, Colin Farrell. Again, getting back to what we were talking about with the rights of publicity. If you use their names on TMZ or in a newsworthy fashion, you're not infringing on the rights of publicity. So I knew that. And I just knew that that would be the pickup. And the next thing you know, I'm on 10, 10 wins AM radio every 10 minutes in New York. Everywhere I went in New York, I was all over the press. My, my posters for American Cannibal were in every subway I took in the Lower East Side. It was crazy the amount of press I got. Um, got me on Dr. Phil. And that's when I met Mike Walters from TMZ. He took me to dinner one night. He's like, I want to do a story about this film. There's so many parts of it that you know, really what TMZ is all about. And I was like, oh, yeah, I've heard of you guys. I read your, you guys used to be celebrity justice, right? Say no more. In 2008, the economy took a shit and everybody was on employment. My porn business at that point was kind of slowing down. So I'm like, what do I have to lose? You know what I'm always surprised about? I feel like there's been so many celebrities and like the biggest celebrities on the planet, obviously the royal family. I'm surprised that there's never been like, a sex tape leaked from the royal family. And I know that sounds weird, but it's just like they're literally the biggest people on the planet. And, you know, everyone talks about them. Their royal weddings become the biggest, you know, fiascos out there. Like, to me, that seems like that would be right up the royal family scandal chart. Okay. You're so good. You eased me into this so well, Dex. You're good. <laughs> you are. So before the pandemic, about four and a half, five years ago, when did they get married, Megan and, and Harry? Uh, you know, five had, years ago, something like that. About five years ago, I get contacted by a woman in Toronto, Canada. Again, the cone of silence. Hey, are you on a secure blind? Are you Kevin Blatt? Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, yeah, what can I do for you? She's like, I have a tape of a woman. I, I really need to talk privately. Though. Are, are, you have to be on a secure line. And I'm like, okay, okay. So I get on WhatsApp and I said, what do you have? She goes, I have a sex tape of a woman who's about to become a princess. I said, princess? Again, I'm not following any of this world of the royalty because I'm not into it, right? They said, yeah, her name's Meghan Markle, and she was in a show called Suits. And I'm like, is it a sex tape with Prince Harry? She's like, no. This is a tape that was made six years earlier. I said, well, how did you get it? Because, you know, that's the whole chain of command. I have to know how someone gets it because... If I film a sex tape with Kim Kardashian, right, there's two copyright holders. There's the person who's holding the camera that's in the sex tape. Both people that are in the sex tape that are naked are copyright holders, co-copyright. If you get something third party, you're technically not a copyright holder, and that could be shut down that way. Mm -hmm. However, possession is still nine-tenths of the law. So if somebody has a sex tape and it's out there and you don't want it around, you should probably get it off the market. So this woman's trying to find out how much it's worth. Now, the funny part was this woman was a very successful person. She comes from money. She has money. It wasn't about the money. Megan had been with a photographer all those years earlier doing a photo shoot in South Beach. And the photographer and her got along pretty well. And they shot a little private tape that she demanded that he immediately delete. And he said he deleted it, but he never fully did. And guy had a little bit of a drug problem, like the nose candy. And one day he meets this contact of mine in Toronto while she's vacationing in Florida and tries to impress her by sending her the video to show off his huge appendage, right? And she obviously falls for the guy and starts sleeping with them. And it becomes a thing. Well, he made her, he said, please delete that video that I sent you because I'm not even supposed to have it. But she kept it. And all these years later, like a lot of people that contact me, they're opportun—they're all opportunists. They all want to know what it's worth, right? So I 
am like, okay, how can we prove it's her? Because I've already gotten in trouble a couple of times. See, in the adult industry, if you look in the back of a jewel case or DVD, or if you even look at the end of a movie that has any kind of uh, nudity on HBO, Showtime, there's something called USC 2257. That's a federal law that states that all people depicted in a sex act must have two rights, uh, two forms of of ID to show that they are over 18 years of age and they consent for putting out their tape. Which, getting back to what you said earlier, is like, didn't Paris have to sign off? Yeah, of course she had to sign off. So did Kim Kardashian. You can't put something out there legally that makes commerce without having their rights. Mm -hmm. Just as if you're in a movie or TV show, they give you a model release. Giving, you know, I had to sign one for the uh, Vice TV thing. I know you did too, right, Dex? So, Mm -hmm. I mean, it's permission. So that's how that all works. What was that? You were talking about Megan. (laughs) I knew I was trying to hide something. I was trying to get away from it. Okay, so long story short, um, I contact a big, powerful lawyer here in town. And I said, I see where you worked with Miss Markle once before. Do you still represent her? He said, no, but I did take some topless pictures off the web for her that were out there. She was in a bikini, topless. And I did represent her, but now she's got a new lawyer, and this is the guy's name. He said, I'd look out, though, and be very careful because, A, he's very paternal and very protective of her. B, I don't think you want Her Majesty's Secret Service or MI6 looking over your shoulder, do you? He had a good point, right? And I said, okay. Again, going back to that tenacious whore side of Kevin Blatt, I elected to contact her lawyer, and I said, look, this is what's going on. Somebody's trying to sell this tape. Would you like to get me involved to get this tape off the market? Because later on, this is what became my career. I played both sides. I got to be honest with you. How, you know and I know that porn doesn't sell like it used to with all the free content out there. So there's actually more money for me to take that stuff off the market. Because you can imagine it's Hollywood. It's Hollywood raw. Right. That's about as raw as it gets. People pay to get this shit off the market because it affects sponsorships. It affects concert tours. It affects impending movies or or TV shows. So there's a a lot of commerce involved with making this stuff go away, which is how I became a Hollywood fixer. The end of the day, what happened with Meghan Markle was the guy says, we know what you're talking about. It's not her. And you can't prove that it's her. And uh, we'll shut it down anyway. But thank you. And I'm like, I never told the guy fully that it was Meghan Markle. I just said, you have a client. This is what it is. I kind of described it, but he knew what I was talking about and denied it was her. And I'm like, okay. And then look at a couple pictures. And in one of the screenshots, she's wearing a Cartier watch. And I looked up the same picture, other pictures of her where she's wearing the same watch. And there's a story behind the watch that she bought it for herself to reward herself when she got the role on Suits. So there's a whole story behind that watch that I even later learned after I did a podcast about this. And there's this whole subculture of people that follow the royal family. Like you can't even imagine. You guys probably do know this, but Mm -hmm. people are psycho. Psycho. They knew everything about the watch. They knew what was inscribed on it. It's crazy. So long story short, they never hired me. I never really fully came out and told the story to anybody. You're getting an exclusive right now. Um, God only knows what's going to happen now. You know, I mean, they're going to get sued again. But I'm going to tell you, I don't think I'm going to, because just with Kim and with Paris, and I've been saying it for years that they're all involved in it. Nobody's sitting for that deposition, guys. Nobody, because they yeah. all know. They all know. That's crazy. Crazy man, you have a a very interesting life, I must say. You know what? It's uh, I used to sell aluminum siding in Cleveland, Ohio, when I was 22 years old. <laughs> I drove a station wagon. I froze my ass off. And all I kept, I wore sunglasses every day and people would call me Hollywood. They'd be like, oh, here comes Hollywood again, selling gutter coil and aluminum siding. And I just couldn't wait to get the hell out of the Midwest and do what I do. I mean, I didn't think this was going to be what I was going to do, but I did tell people, you'll be hearing about me someday and you'll see me on television. And I'm going to get involved in some stuff. I'm either going to be in the entertainment business or I'm going to go into porn, which is so crazy how it was all foreshadowed. So, so- t- Go ahead. Yeah. No, I was going to say, so obviously Hollywood Fixer is sort of what you do as what you're currently doing, which is crisis PR. How does yeah. it kind of correlate with each other, the crisis PR and 
Hollywood fixer because I think what you just said before earlier three minutes ago is something that really nailed it on the head for me where you have to sort of play both sides and and that's the best way for you to monetize it. Correct. So, you know, there was three sides of the coin when TMZ and my relationship was very fruitful. And that was something comes in. I go, well, can we, is there going to be a company or a website that's going to want to promote this to get traffic to their website and get attention and news? If not, then maybe it'll become a news story. Maybe I'll call up the guys at TMZ or Radar or, or Daily Mail and see what they would pay for a story like this. But I do have something I'll show you. And this is my number one tool on how I create and get a lot of these sex tapes. Adam's going to like this. I think you're both going to like this a lot. So my business card, you know, being a guy that's the man about town in Hollywood, I deal with valets. I deal with waiters. I deal with the real people that see the celebrities get involved in all the hush hush stuff, right? Doormen. So I have to have a clever card that'll get their attention, right? So one of you guys, just one of you guys, I want you to pick a number for me. Uh, three. Okay. I'm going to leave my phone number out of here. But what does that say right there? All sex maniacs pick three. <laughs> <laughs> Ta-da! <laughs> what number would you have picked, Adam? Uh, you know what? I I, I was actually going to say three, but it's... That's so I was going to say three. Listen, that gimmick, alone, that gimmick alone has gotten me more dates than you could ever imagine, but it's also got <laughs> more sex tips, more dick pics, more text messages that nobody should ever send anybody. It That card gets circulated and everybody wants to keep that card because the first thing they say is how did you know right yeah. or they'll go do that again what it is and again this is another good story is i was at an adult convention in jamaica it was like a little networking event and we were all drinking mushroom tea one day and tripping before mushrooms were a thing I'm talking about 18 years ago and as I'm walking down the beach, I see this old man who looks like Ernest Hemingway with a long white beard. And he's got this airbrushed T-shirt of a muscle guy. And he's walking towards my friend Jonathan Silverstein and I. And we're like, bro, we love that shirt, dude. And the guy's nothing. Reaches into his board shorts and goes like this. And we both look at each other and we go, three? And he just flips the card over. And it's just footsteps walking down the beach. Gone. We fell in the sand and we laughed our asses off for 25 minutes. We're like, who was that guy? That's the magic man. Two days later, we see him at Rick's Cafe in Negril. Bro, he's the guy with the card. How could you know that? My, my email address at that time, by the way, was kb at pornstar.com. I used to run pornstar.com. Yeah. Said, We're with an adult convention. How did you do that? I said, I'm a retired professor, taught psychology in Yale. It's a right-handed versus left-handed study. If you're right-handed and you're given those four numbers, 89% of the time, you're going to pick three. The other 11%, you're either left-handed or you have an affinity for that number. It's your lucky number. It's your birthday. And I kid you not, he is 100% right. The only times I think that it hasn't worked in like a public setting, I asked Snoop Dogg, I'm like, yo, Snoop, pick a number. And he's like, I pick deuces, K Bissell. Like, <laughs> it's your Snoop Dogg, right? So, uh, when it works, it's brilliant. When it doesn't work, eh, it's still a good card to give out and people still remember it. That's so funny. So random. So who right now are like the type of clients right, right now for you as a crisis PR person? Who are the type of people that reach out to you for help? Agents, managers, and mostly lawyers. Um, I can't really go into Brittany right now because it's a very bad situation that I don't want to talk about. But there's people that will call me that are kind of on the outside looking in. You know, one of the things that people don't understand, and I know you guys get this, is when there's a scandal of epic proportions like this, it isn't so much that it's just the celebrity that gets affected by it. You know, it's the celebrity's makeup artist. It's their manager. It's their agent. It's a booking agent. It's an accountant. There's a whole team behind these people. So if somebody hurts, everybody hurts, Right. It's like this trickle down thing here with the strike. It's like, okay, well, if the writers are striking, now the actors are striking, and it just trickles down. Now there's restaurants up the street here that used to be full 
for lunch every single day that are half empty and they're all crying because of the strike. So yeah, you, you have this um, economics that get involved with when a celebrity gets in a lot of trouble. And sometimes it's when the agent, the manager, or the other people, they'll all pull their money together to make something go away because they got to get their gravy train running again. They can't lose the client. So At this point, I, do you think they're, it's too far past with Britney though? Like it's, it's, I think Britney, I think Britney, save Britney. If you're watching this out there, she needs love and she needs somebody watching out for her right now. Very, and where, where there is no one there. That's the sad part. There's There's nobody parents. There's no family. There's like, and she's pushed everyone out. Now she's got no, no husband. And I, I don't know if he was a good guy, bad guy. I, I don't know much about him to be totally honest. There is nobody minding the store. She's off the rails. She's sick. And, um, her security, it appears that everybody that's attached to this woman is just turning their, their blind eye to what's going on. And everybody, and there's so many leaks within her camp that are coming back to me via other people because they're concerned for her. It's not that they're trying to sell their stories. They're just concerned that she could become the next Amy Winehouse right now. And I'm I'm concerned. I don't know her that well. I've seen her out a couple of times. I actually met her at a friend of mine's party because she used to date Jason Trawick, who was a nice guy. who was a William Morris agent. Um, and um, she's a sweet little girl, comes from a very troubled background, and she's got some mental issues. And, you know, there was a reason why that conservatorship was put in place. And as much as everybody wanted to, you know, call her father the devil and everything he actually did the best job that he could and i could tell you that larry rudolph back in the day when he was her manager was able to keep the train on the track this is not um this is not a good situation and i hope that if there's anybody out there that could help her that they do and um she gets the help that she needs but yeah there's situations like that that arise uh they'll call me um if there's something that I could do in this particular case, there's nothing I can do. I, I'm not in her house. I don't have a sex tape. I don't, you know, what am I going to do for her? There are other things I'm working on right now where it's a little bit more um, sensitive in nature. It's just crazy. I mean, since the pandemic got ended, it's like everything's gone crazy. People were cooped up for too long. And now all of a sudden people got back to working. Things were great. And people were out partying again and doing stupid things. And my phone was ringing. And then all of a sudden the strike happened. <laughs> so now I'm kind of like sitting here working on other people, you know, TikTokers and athletes keep me really busy. It's crazy how many uh, hip hop people do stupid things. But again, I call it all the dummy tax, right? If you're an athlete, if you're a DJ, if you're a daytime television figure and you're making a sex tape, on another woman's phone that is not yours and it gets to me, you're going to pay what I call the dummy tax because you are a dummy. (laughs) (laughs) You don't do that, that, right? Von Miller had that happen a couple years ago and the story was covered on TMZ. I think you were there at the time. You know, it was a stupid thing. And, you know, he went crazy. His lawyer went crazy. I'm like, hey, man, don't shoot the messenger. Your client was dumb. He made a sex tape on someone else's phone, dude. What are yep. you What are you gonna do? Yep, dumb, dumb, dumb. So yeah, I uh, Adam, it's it, it's interesting. Like I said, you asked some really good questions, and some of them I would really like to tell you even more. And I feel like I probably talk too much, to be honest with you. It was a <laughs> <sock>. <laughs> but, uh, and I feel like I controlled this whole hour. Um, it's interesting, man. Like I can't talk to a lot of people about what I do. So it, when people take interest in it, I like to share some of the stories because it is interesting. And, um, you know, there's a lot of people that when I go out on dates with girls, they're, they're petrified that I have hidden cameras all over my house and I'm keeping sex tapes of them and stuff. And I have to explain to them, look, I don't even want to see myself naked and not, I'm not on the lights. You know, <laughs> the last thing I want to do is is make sex tapes of you. You know, I try, <laughs> try to make them go away. Oh man, Kevin! Well, you've had quite the hell of a wild life in Hollywood. So many stories, and I bet there's so many more that you can't even tell us um, today on on a public forum. But uh, thank you for coming enough. on, buddy. I said enough. I know this is going to backfire. <laughs> yeah, said enough. Um, It'll be interesting to see who's going to have an issue. And again, 
nobody's sitting for these depositions. I can guarantee you that because it's um, it's all true. Yeah. So when you talk the truth, I never worry about things. Maybe I should more. You've actually made me think that I need to worry a little bit more about my profession after telling you about getting blindfolded and thrown in hatchbacks of Hondas. <laughs> I'm just nervous for you, buddy. Be careful out there. All right. It's a wild world. You know what, dude? I think as long as um, as long as I keep doing these shows and I keep uh, getting in front of people and I keep getting more stuff, I'm going to keep doing the Lord's work and make all this crazy stuff disappear. <laughs> well, thank yeah. you again for taking the time sitting down with us. It was fun catching up and hearing uh, your your uh, interesting stories about how you've gotten to where you're at. By the way, I'm proud of you both. Seriously, it's uh, it's great to see you guys thriving, especially with both your businesses, Dax and uh, and Adam. It's it's great that you're still doing what you're doing all these years later. Yeah, man, uh, it's great to it's it's great to see you. It's uh, your stories are. I mean, you have so many stories that it's just these are the stories that people love. It's just and you know, and I'll I'll say that it, these stories obviously are, were from a lot of these stories were from the past. Yes. it was a different time. You know, now, obviously, the way we approach these stories, there's a different – there's more sympathy to these stories. The outlets don't really work with these stories. But it was at, – at the, this was a very hot topic at a different time. Like I said, you know, the Meghan Markle thing just really – picked up again because everybody and, and you guys know this from being in the media you guys know this it's like we have such an obsession with celebrity and we have such a uh, obsession with building them up and making them these huge people because we love to tear them down and why do we like to tear them down because it's like we love the phoenix rising from the ashes it's such a weird dysfunctional thing with america we just love to root for the underdog we love to blow them up exploit the hell out of them just so they could crash and burn because we want to see them reinvent and Tory spelling themselves right back out of wherever they are. Yeah. You know, that poor thing. God, that's well, that's well, who we need on our podcast. We need Tory. Damn it. I All think right. we can probably get that. All you have to do is give her a place to stay. Oh, oh man. Awesome. Kevin. Yeah, thank, thank you, so, thank much, you so much, bud. Hey, thanks for having me on guys. Anytime you want me back, give me a call. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Wow. Kevin is, uh, he's got so many stories. Interesting guy. And I, I, and like I said on the podcast, I'll say it again. These stories were at a different time. These are very big stories. So you could say what you want. You could have an opinion saying this was screwed up. But Kevin wasn't the only one because this was all, entertainment news was so um, sort of, I mean, it was. So I would say those. Uh, those early 2000s like that was the thing like there were so many sex tapes there were so many just stories like that when the blogs were really big Perez Hilton was huge at the time like this was like what everyone was talking about it was a weird time in pop culture at it that was, moment that exact it was a time thing it was the biggest thing in its time Kevin was the guy he was the guy he was the guy that celebrities or people who were making sex videos would go to to get the best deal he was also like he said the guy who would help kind of make sure the stuff would not get out would go away yeah and and you know what it still happens today you know and and when i mean videos it doesn't always have to be a sex thing there's a lot of bad crazy videos that go out there that they need someone to kind of negotiate the deal and make sure it doesn't come out to same thing with the photo agencies. When they get a crazy video in their hands, the first thing they sell to or they try to give it to, so you know, a lot of times, as you know, Dex, is to the celebrity themselves. So they're they're I don't want to say just as guilty, but they're involved in it as well. Yeah. Hundred percent. Well, interesting. Hopefully people enjoyed that. Um uh, and didn't turn out too soon. <laughs> but uh, yeah, definitely a different side of Hollywood, I must say. Like you said, it is definitely the raw side of Hollywood there for sure. So anyway, thank you guys so much for uh, listening to this episode. Um, please take a second, uh, leave us a review on, uh, um, what is it, Apple Podcasts? Leave us a review. Apple Podcasts. Take the time. We read them at the top of the show because we really do appreciate it. We want to give you your moment of shine, your moment in the sun, and uh, we could give you your flowers there live on the, uh, on the podcast. Um, please take a moment, head on over to our 
private Facebook group off the record. We, you know, this is where we really get a moment to chat with you guys personally, respond to your comments, listen to what you did like, what you didn't like about the podcast. If we had audio issues, all the stuff, we uh, we get to hear about it in our private Facebook group. Uh, and obviously, we've got a Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube page, all of it at Hollywood Raw. Uh, you can follow Adam at Adam Glenn. You can follow me at Dax Holt. Until next time, we're out. What's up, guys? If you like that video, there's plenty more that came from. Make sure you like, subscribe, hit the bell so we can just feed you all the goodness daily. Hurry up. Come on. Let's go. Oh.